Greetings, music nerds, and welcome to season eight of the Music Makers and Soul Shakers podcast. This season is brought to you by our newest sponsors, Larivee Guitars and Fishman Amplification. I'm your host, Steve Dawson, coming to you from the Hen House Studio in Nashville, Tennessee. This season, I'll be taking you on a journey down the many rabbit holes in the process of making great music. I'll be speaking to instrumentalists, songwriters, producers, up-and-comers through legendary veterans, and we'll go deep into their history and their process of creating unforgettable music. This show continues to be listener-supported. You can help keep the show going with a one-time donation or a Patreon subscription. And when you sign up for Patreon, you get an ad-free version of the show, as well as getting entered to win some killer prizes from our sponsors at the end of the season. We have an incredible Chase Bliss lossy pedal up for grabs, as well as a Fishman acoustic guitar pickup and effects pedals, as well as a pedal from Union Tube and Transistor, and more. You can get links to all this and sign up now at makersandshakerspodcast.com. Meanwhile, many thanks to the sponsors for this season. Please check them out and let them know that I sent you. They are Larivee Guitars, Fishman Pickups, Chase Bliss Pedals, Union Tube and Transistor, Spectra 1964, and The Hen House Hang. All right, thanks for tuning in. And let's get down to it. Howdy, music nerds, and welcome back to episode number 168 of the show. On the podcast today is the groundbreaking banjo player, Mr. Tony Trishka. Just a shout out to some new Patreon subscribers this week, Brian Miller and Andrew Barbasan. And just wanted to mention that the end of the season is coming up, I don't know, in a few more episodes. It was supposed to be a 15-episode season. It's probably going to be more like a 16 or 17-episode season. So when that finally comes to an end, which will be sometime probably in January, I'm going to be giving away a bunch of cool stuff from Union Tube and Transistor, some pedals, which are incredible, some great pedals from Fishman as well, and a DI, some DIs from Spectra 1964, incredible. And our latest sponsor is Chase Bliss, who make the craziest, coolest, most nerdy pedals on the planet. And uh, they have given us a lossy pedal to give away. And that's a really cool sort of lo-fi, crazy thing. And I've been having a lot of fun with one here, and I'm going to be giving one away. So all you have to do is join the Patreon. You can support the show for as little as a couple bucks a month. It really helps things out, and it gets you automatically entered into the draw for the prizes. So check it out. You can join the Patreon over at makersandshakerspodcast.com. So summer is winding down here finally, and it's nice to get a bit of a break from the relentless heat. We've had our first pop-up session. We went, I went to Calgary last week and uh, did a pop-up session there, which was a lot of fun. And basically for those, my band and I set up shop uh, in a studio in a certain city. In this case, it was Calgary. And we were at OCL Studios, which was great. And my band and I set up shop and songwriters kind of buy into our time there and come through and in an hour we record and mix a song for them, which is really crazy. So we do six of those a day. We did 30 songs for 18 artists in five days. Woo! It was a blast. We're going to be doing more of those. We've got another one coming up in Vancouver. And uh, I'd love to have some of you out there if anyone is interested in doing such crazy stuff. I'm also going to be heading out to Vancouver to do my annual show where I take an album that I pick and bring in a bunch of guests and everybody does a song from that album. And this year we are doing Neil Young's After the Gold Rush. That's in Vancouver in October. We've got a bunch of great Vancouver artists. We've got Joe Henry coming in. We've got Steve Poltz coming in. We've got Sue Foley coming in. We've got Julian Taylor coming in. It's going to be amazing. So that's all coming up. Should be a fun fall. And as usual, I'm going to be doing some shows around Nashville with my band, the Volcano Brothers. And so, yeah, I hope to run into some of you out there. So Tony Trishka is on the show this week. Now, I first saw Tony playing with his band called Psychograss back in the, I don't know, early 90s, maybe sometime at a bluegrass festival in Vancouver. I was pretty young and I didn't know much about bluegrass at that point in my life. So Psychograss was kind of what I thought bluegrass was. <laughs> And uh, they're pretty insane and progressive. Uh, David Greer on guitar, Tony on banjo. Was Russ Berenberg maybe in that band? I don't even really remember. Anyway, they were insanely good. They were not traditional bluegrass, but I didn't know any better. So to me, that's sort of what bluegrass was for a while until I kind of realized that, oh, that's not really bluegrass. Uh, so Tony's from Syracuse, and he spent most of his career in the New York area, which I find interesting, actually. There's regions of music in the U.S. I've talked about this a little bit before, 
for bluegrass, also, there's kind of regions of uh, scenes. There's a California bluegrass scene. There's a Nashville scene. There's a kind of a Virginia, Maryland scene. And there's a New York scene. I was there recently, and I saw a killer show with uh, Tony Trishka playing, and Michael Daves was playing, who's an incredible singer and guitar player. Andy Statman was playing mandolin. Yeah, it was awesome. And those are sort of the New York cats, which is really cool to see. Um, Tony's early bands included the Down City Ramblers, Country Cooking, Country Granola, and Breakfast Special. He also started making really cool solo records under his own name in the early 70s that are really kind of out there in the context of what was going on those days in bluegrass. They were really progressive as well and experimental. He was also teaching a youngster named Bela Fleck a thing or two in some lessons. So he's been around. And after working to progress the banjo and its role in music through his entire career, Tony's suddenly dropped this amazing new project on us that is super traditional and has allowed him to mine the depths of the greatness of Earl Scruggs. The new record is called Earl Jam, and I'll let him explain it and talk about what it is. But basically, he got tapes laid on him of Earl and John Hartford jamming, like hundreds of hours of this stuff, unheard music that is like a portal into the brain of Earl Scruggs. Anyway, Tony transcribed a bunch of those jam sessions, and those transcriptions are what you hear on the album, along with guests like Molly Tuttle and Billy Strings. So let's dive into all this amazing history and hear about the new record. You can get all the latest info on Tony at TonyTrishka.com. And with that, enjoy my conversation with Tony Trishka. Well, thanks for doing this, Tony. I really appreciate it, man. I've, I've been uh, following yeah. your music for years. I, I remember seeing you actually, I'm, I'm, from, I'm in Nashville now, but I, I, I'm from Vancouver originally. And I remember seeing Psychograss back at when the... Um, oh, God. <laughs> the the there was there used to be a bluegrass festival in Vancouver at the Granville Island well Granville Island and it was actually a pretty good festival and that stopped happening sometime in the nineties but I do remember seeing Psychograss there and it really blew my mind it was really awesome yeah we were pretty psycho but uh, it was <laughs> fun it was fun we we were too dis. It was hard to, someone, you know, David Greer was in Nashville. I was in New Jersey. The other guys were in California. Sometimes Mike Marshall was in in uh, Germany and it uh, became untenable after a while, but it was fun while it lasted. I can imagine. Was that a pretty democratic group as far as like how you guys arranged everything and wrote, or was it somebody in particular kind of steering that ship? No, it was democratic. It was definitely democratic. You know, we would each bring a tune to the band and with our own ideas. And of course, everyone, I won't speak for myself, but everyone else has this really high level of musicianship. And uh, so it would, you know, you'd come in with one concept, but how about if we do this? Oh, yeah, that's much hipper to do it that way. So anyway, yeah, it was very democratic. I know that uh, collaboration has been a big part of your career and your life in various things, whether it's being in a band or just being in something that that uh, really lasted for like one project, um, which is a really interesting kind of way to look at some of your, uh, your you, know, you know, your your history of recorded works too, um, just sort of seeing various formations that you've gone through and people that you've played with over the years. And um, I, I'm dying to know about this new record, The Earl Jam, because... I know it's not out yet. Probably by the time this podcast comes out, it will be mm -hmm. released. All I know about the the concept is that, and I don't know how true this is, but that uh, some sort of hard drive appeared at your place containing some jams with Earl Scruggs and John Hartford. It, can you tell me anything about that? Yes. Um, yeah, basically, uh, this guy I know sent me a thumb drive of over 200 of these songs from various jam sessions. Uh, ranging from the mid '80s to the mid '90s, <clears throat> from what I understand, and uh, there's a guy named Bob Peekel, which is P-I-E-K-E-L, who lives in Syracuse, New York, where I'm from, and um, we were both working on um, making corrections to this Earl Scruggs book that had come out. There's the original Earl Scruggs book that came out in '68. This was one that came out I don't know when, seven or eight years ago, and it said accurate transcriptions, except it was. Uh, the transcriptions were by guitar players who had no idea of the fingering that Earl might use. I mean, it was bizarre. Anyway, so this guy by wow. asked this Bob Peekle to fix the second edition, but they only gave him a weekend. So the third edition, I got called in along with another banjo player named Tom Adams, and the three of us worked on it. And every once in a while, Bob Peekle would just send me a, a tune from one of these jam sessions. And I went, what's this? And it's like really cool stuff. 
And then he finally just sent me a thumb drive of everything that he had. So at some point, uh, well, Bob Peekle, the guy who get, sent me the thumb drive, he had gone to some of these jam sessions. And he mentioned that at some point, John Hartford called him and said, in case my house ever burns down, all this music would be lost. So let me uh, let me send you uh, copies of all these recordings so they'll at least be in two places and this music won't be lost. And he did. And that's how Bob Peekle got a hold of all these recordings. And then again, he sent me a thumb drive of over 200 of these tunes. And that's how I ended up with them. So what are they exactly? They're just jam? It's jam sessions, apparently, that took place from what I was told. I never made it to any of these jam sessions, but the idea was that John Hartford wanted to get Earl back into playing. Earl had sort of been off the scene with health issues and just kind of off the scene after traveling for so many years, I guess. Um, and John wanted to make sure that his, you know, he didn't just give up music entirely or something like that. I wanted to keep him active. So I started having these jam sessions. And you hear some of the stuff that Earl was doing, and it's just remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, it's as good as anything he ever did, because there's sort of this thought, you know, you get older and you, you lose your touch a little bit, perhaps. And um, <clears throat> the few albums that Earl did in later years, he sounds really good, but it's not as exciting as what he was doing in the 50s or the, even the early to mid 60s. But I think a lot of that was because of the produ the producers, whoever was, yeah, you know, the projects he was doing weren't quite as exciting as if someone else had been producing them. I was about to say if I was producing them, but that would be a little too patting myself on the back because I would have, I guess I'll go in this direction. Why not? Um, <laughs> he did a, an album with Tom. He did an album with Tom T. Hall called The Storyteller yeah. and the Banjo Man or something like that. And it's really nice, but they're all kind of medium tempo songs where he might take one break. You know, nothing really letting him be Earl. Yeah. Uh, and I would have just picked the hottest musicians in Nashville, you know, and just let him do tunes that he wanted to do. Just let, let him, him rip. rip, which is what he does in these jam sessions. Sometimes it's just John and Earl, just the two of them. Uh, and sometimes there might be a bass added, just the three of them. Once in a while, you hear Tony Rice in there. Sometimes Sam Bush, Del McCurry here and there, Mac Wiseman. I could recognize his voice talking. Wow. Sometimes a whole huge number of folks. Sounds like a big party. But a lot of it is just the two of them or two of them with a the guitar player. It's small scale things. Sometimes it's just John taking fiddle, uh, play, playing a fiddle tune with, with Earl backing him up. But a lot of times it would be you know, Earl taking two or three solos in a row where he just gets to get deeper and deeper into it. I, I keep using the term swinging for the fences, but that's what he was doing. And sometimes he'd be playing really fast. You know, you think, well, you know, Earl's slowing down, he's getting older. And these recordings, he's just burning. You know, like, 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 wow, it doesn't sound that fast because <laughs> he, he and Bill Monroe were the same way that you could just sounds relaxed and yet you try moving your fingers that fast god they're burning it down here and anyway so some of the times he's doing tunes that we've heard him do before like cripple creek to name one and but it's not just the way he did it uh they're like in some cases there are five or six versions of each of these tunes from over the years uh cripple creek was one of those and uh in one of the versions of it he plays this incredibly syncopated bluesy uh, solo in the middle of it. And Cripple Creek is not a blues tune by any stretch of the imagination, but he just like doing that and say, like, what, what is this? Uh, and again, uh, some of the tunes, I should just have a list so I can just rattle them off, but they do, um, they do Gentle on My Mind. Uh, they do Brown's Ferry Blues. They do Amazing Grace. Uh, just a, a whole bunch of tunes that we've never heard Earl do before. Does Earl know uh, Gentle on My Mind? Like, that's not the simplest tune to just, like, pick up and start jamming on. He did. I, well, she, that's a very good point. And that's something that occurred to me that unless they sat down and just practiced these for 10 minutes before they recorded them, then how would he – does he really know all these tunes? But I kind of think he did. I can't picture them. Oh. Let's, it's, not, it's not like they're practicing for a gig or something. They're just, oh, hey, let's try this. Okay, and they do it. And the one that really – as we used to say in the 60s, blew my mind, was uh, since these are all alphabetically and I'm going down the list and suddenly there's Here Comes the Bride. What? And they did Here Comes the Bride, just <laughs> jamming out on it. 
which uh, I've, re- yeah. I've I have recorded, um, which I've recorded twenty five tunes. Well, uh, basically, I started transcribing what Earl was playing, which I've been doing for many many years, transcribing his music to to learn what he did, really get deeply into it. So once I started hearing these amazing solos, I wanted to find out what's he really playing and slow down to half speed and transcribed it. And I started thinking at some point um, I should record these things because these tapes, these recordings may never see the light of day. So um, I got the idea to uh, record a bunch of these things where I would play only what Earl played note for note, none of my own ideas, just all Earl which is what I've done. Whoa. And I've recorded 25, 25 of these tunes and um, 15 of which are going to be on this new album coming out June 7th called Earl Jam, appropriately. Yeah. And then there are another 10 that have um, that will be released in about a year after the June 7th release, roughly a year after. And I'll add another three or four tunes to that. Um, but anyway, here comes the bride will be on the second iteration. I got Michael Cleveland to play fiddle. <laughs> yeah, okay. Michael Cleveland to play fiddle and I got Mark Schatz to do oh, that's the other thing. You know, it's just John and Earl playing Here Comes the Bride, except you can hear John dancing because he would do this sort of clog and buck and wing kind sure. of a dance. Yeah. Sometimes when he was on stage. And there's no audience. It's just the two of them, but he felt like dancing. So I got Mark Schatz to uh Got got Mark Schatz to do the uh, Mark Schatz to do the clogging part, and then I had Sam Bush sing uh, one verse of it. Here comes the bride, except he sings it like Harry Carey, who was the voice of the Chicago Cubs, imitating him. It's it's, <laughs> it's fun and bizarre all at the same time. So, and that's just that one tune. So, is there more than one verse to "Here Comes the Bride"? Uh, I think there is, but that I'm sorry. It's not on the, uh, God, you haven't even heard it yet. And you're already complaining. You didn't do all the verses. <laughs> I'm teasing. I just uh, assumed we, there was only one like verse. One to verse that. was enough. Uh, there may be yeah. more. We only did the one verse. This is a really fascinating process then. So you have, so for this record, you have literally like transcribed note for note what Earl is doing, and that's your gig on this record is to play those exact transcriptions. Exactly. There's none, nothing of my own, none of my own ideas on this, Whoa. except for the backup. The backup I'm just playing, but it's very Scruggsy. You know, uh, it's Earl Scruggs' backup that I've you know been playing for years and know how to do that. Um, I can't play exactly like Earl, of course, but you know, using his vocabulary, I played oh. on the second album. Um, I have Billy Strings singing Gentle on My Mind, and that'll be on the second album. And um, I had just worked up one solo, and I was having trouble playing it because what Earl did was very complicated. I worked it up the night before, and it was, and just as a placeholder, so I was going to go back and overdub what Earl played. As a placeholder, I just played whatever I would play. And uh, Bela Fleck was mm-hmm. uh, producing that particular session. He said, just let's have at least one thing on this album that's you. So. That'll be on the second album, but except for that one solo, everything else is Earl. Wow, that's intense. So what did you learn from that? I mean, I, I would imagine, and we can talk about this as well, but I would imagine that you spent a lot of time learning Earl Scruggs stuff like as a kid when you were starting and and he was a huge part of your learning musical life. But I'm guessing that this, you know, learning stuff that he was playing at, at that stage of his life would have been really eye-opening for you as a musician and a banjo player just to see like partly like what he had evolved into at that point and like what are some of the things that you sort of picked up that he had evolved into or had done differently that he wouldn't have done in say 1959 uh i learned uh, well I guess I would use the word profound. It was a, it wasn't radically different. Some of it was radically different, like this blues thing on on uh, Cripple Creek. But a lot of it was the syncopations he's doing. Uh, for those that don't know, syncopation is when notes are accented that you don't expect to be accented. And um, I got friendly with Earl in his later years, and he mentioned to me once that he thought what he brought to the banjo was syncopation, <clears throat> which no one was doing anything like what he was doing when he joined Bill Monroe in 1945. Uh, and some of that was the syncopation, but it, to me, it got even more intense as time went on in his later years. And I've been saying lately that, well, I thought I knew how to play. I thought I understood Scruggs style, had a pretty good handle on it, but I realized, no, I knew nothing compared to <laughs> what I'm learning now. Uh, it was just on this whole other level, uh, just a, a deeper 
can't say more exciting because it's always been exciting, but just much deeper understanding of what he was doing. And he, he was just going farther out because, and he said, well, there's so many things to say here. I don't even know where to, I, I keep getting off on these tangents, but um, it's great. This, Go this, for re- it. <laughs> this relates because uh, I got friendly with a woman, Mary Beth, who runs the Earl Scrugg Center in Shelby, North Carolina. I met her at the uh, IBM Association uh, yeah. gathering uh, a year and a half ago. And this past Jan- a year ago, this past January, <clears throat> which was January of 2023, she just gave me a call out of the blue and said that after Gary Scruggs died, who was the last surviving direct member of Earl's family, um, all the things that was left after Earl died, his banjos, his ephemera, songbooks, notebooks, whatever, all went to the Earl Scruggs Center. And while Mary Beth and a couple of her uh, cohorts were going through all this material, she said, uh, we found this Mickey Mouse notebook, uh, this, you know, like a notebook, <laughs> kind of a children's notebook with Mickey Mouse on the cover, big color picture of Mickey Mouse. And uh, they opened it up and there in Earl's own handwriting were 60 pages of him telling his story uh, of his early life Whoa. up through the time of um, joining Bill Monroe. And it's just like incredible, incredible nude uh, look at his at his life, things we never heard about. Uh, things like he's, he said, uh, I was never a home-loving boy. I mean, I'm sorry. I was always a home-loving boy. I never wanted to travel. I thought the most, maybe when I get older, I'll buy a house in Asheville, North Carolina, and have a up in the mountains and have a stream running through it. Uh, and how uh, he had a family farm. I didn't realize that there was a farm that he grew up on uh, when he was living in Flint Hill, North Carolina. He said he'd be you know, plowing the field uh, behind a mule and he'd be picking finger patterns with his right hand on the plow handle just because he had that music in wow. him. And he, he said also another thing was when he first started playing locally with local musicians that um, before he was playing with local musicians, he could just play one tune all day long. He's just playing by himself and he could play as much as he wanted. Suddenly he's playing in a band and it was frustrating to him that he can only take one solo, maybe two solos in the in in the tune, because there are other soloists. And I just started thinking about that because in these recordings, and and that was true for every recording he ever did. You don't get to just play forever, but in these recordings, right. so again, as I said, he'll 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 play three times through a tune, four times through a tune, just back to back, over and over again. Uh, so he could play as much as he wanted because it was just him and John jamming. And probably probably Hartford was egging him on too, I bet, right? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, you know. Yeah, once in a while they're alternating, but, you know, you can hear John sort of laying back doing – John was always playing fiddle. He'd be strumming the fiddle sometimes and uh, or just okay. sort of chopping with the fiddle bow. But you don't hear him, like, jumping in to take the next solo. He's just kind of waiting almost. So you can just let – yeah, let's let Earl yeah. be Earl. Uh, another thing, yeah, and another thing that Earl said was in these writings, these rare unearthed writings, were uh, was that another thing that bothered him was when he was playing with these local musicians that they were always very serious when they played and they weren't smiling. And you know, and if you look at these videos of Earl playing with Lester Flat in the uh, late fifties, early sixties for Martha White Flower, you can just see this little smile on his face when he looked out at the camera while he's playing. It's, and I always thought that was kind of, and it's, I thought. This is what he, you know, he practiced what he preached. Yeah, he was, a, he was, I mean, that it's very joyful. Just one more thing about those, that, those recordings, because I'm just so fascinated by this whole thing. So they were probably done at Hartford's house in Nashville. And are they good quality? I, like, are I, they studio quality? Or is it just sort of like a tape deck sitting in a room? I, uh, apparently, I was told that mostly it was Earl's house, not John's house. Uh, okay. And I think that was, hey, John, let's jam rather than having Earl have to come over. It was John's suggestion, so I think John... Went over there, and then they. I, I don't know if it was always like that, but apparently it was at Earl's house. Uh, no, apparently John would bring a a small cassette machine uh, to the mm-hmm. to the uh, proceedings, and apparently recorded every single jam session. And so the quality is not wow. exactly not exactly great. And sometimes John gets a little too close to the microphone, and it's like, and I can hear okay. Earl playing something really great, but I can't quite make out what it is. Which is is kind of frustrating because it's uh, he's he's you know obviously killing it is some amazing solo, but John's you know I can't accurately transcribe what he's playing. 
but a lot of the time I can. A lot of the time I am I am able yeah. to make out what he's playing and uh, pretty clearly because he's really close to the mic and it's just John playing fiddle. So it's not like you have a whole band and you're trying to make out what's being played. For this project then, did you go through the entire thing? Like, did you mine the whole set of recordings? That's a lot to go through and transcribe. No, 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 I didn't. I just, uh, first okay. I went for the tunes that we'd never heard him play before. Like Bill Cheatham, here's a case in point. Okay. Um, Flan Scruggs did an album with Doc Watson called Strictly Instrumental. And uh, yeah. it's great, you know, because it's Doc Watson and it's Earl. And uh and as it says, it's all instrumentals. And so there's some things that um, they'd recorded before, but, you know, Flatten Scruggs had. But there were uh, things that they had not recorded before, including Bill Cheatham. And I've always wondered, how, how, can, how am I supposed to play Bill Cheatham? What did Earl do? I mean, I, I've been playing it for years, but I'm, I'm listening. And, okay, there's a fiddle break, and then a dobro break, then another fiddle break. Okay, here comes Earl's solo. No, there's no Earl's solo. It's a harmonica break. What? And Earl doesn't take a solo on it. <laughs> So my whole life, I've never known how to play Bill Cheatham the right way. <clears throat> so here in these recordings, there are five Bill Cheathams over the years. And I listened to the first one, no banjo solo, it's all fiddle, second, all fiddle, third. The fifth version, the last version, the last hope, there it is. Earl takes two solos on it. Oh, thank you, Earl. Thank you. Now I know what to do. And it's really cool what he, yeah, exactly. I it was sort of like Rocky at the top of the steps of the Philadelphia Art Museum, <laughs> you know, fist pumping over his head. That was me. Yeah. And uh, Earl just killed it and, and did some really cool syncopated stuff uh, at the end, different than any that I've ever heard anyone else do, and, and did some odd, crazy notes in there too. So it's really cool. So yeah. uh, that's just a case in point. So I went for the tunes like that th that I had not ever heard him play before. Rose of San, San Antonio Rose, what did he play on that? that he never recorded that. And you know, a lot of these are things that ended up on the albums. And I just went for the tunes, first the tunes that I had not heard him do before, and then the tunes that he did play before or record before, but what did he play that might have been different, like Cripple Creek, like I said. Uh, I've, re I've transcribed between 35 and 40 of these, um, but there's a whole lot more to go through. And, and there are some cases, as I said, where it's just John playing just fiddle, there's no, there's no banjo solo on it. So. I've gone through a lot. I've listened right. to a lot of it, but I haven't done it in any sort of systematic order. But there's there's more to yeah. be found for sure. And I'm I'm hoping uh, at some point, I've talked to Hal Leonard about this, doing a book of these tunes and they seem interested. Um, sometime, well, I want to wait for the second album to come out because I'll, I want to do everything from both albums. And once I figure out the tunes on the second album, I'll have all those tunes, which will probably about be about 30 tunes plus maybe another 10 or 20 of stuff that won't be on the albums just to have. So everyone can, you know, have a chance to play these things. Man, that's just, it's so crazy to think of, you know, like there's, there's no equivalent in for a lot of, for most musicians of something like that. That's just like a gold mine of, of material, you know, like if you think about having like 200 hours of lost Jimi Hendrix recordings or Sun House, like <laughs> There's just nothing really to compare it to. It's crazy. That's so cool that you got to do that. Yeah, to have that much material. I mean, you know, there's there are outtakes of her, you know from our famous favorite rock stars of the '60s or whatever, but not not this deep a well. And to have this yeah. plus these right Earl that have just come to light all within the last. Well, I didn't know about the recordings till now, but at least I'm going to make these available to people. The uh, you know my interpretations playing with other musicians. Uh, but having, at least for me personally, suddenly hear 60 pages of Earl telling his not total life story, but a lot of his early years and the recordings, both. It's just a whole much, much deeper insight into what Earl Earl's life was like. The the two tunes that I have heard uh, that are released so far are the the one with Molly Tuttle and the one with Billy Strings, which are really cool too. So right. how did those factor in? Were those tunes that he was playing with John or something? Everything everything is from these jam sessions. Yeah. The, um, I'm going to the Sunsbury Blues, which I actually heard him play. Oh, it's so deep. There's so much to say. Um, I was out in Missouri. Uh, I was I had a chance to uh, to uh, produce Steve Martin's set called Rare Bird Alert. And so I went out to Missouri because he was doing a show out there. Uh, and Earl Scruggs, was, his band was uh, opening up. And... Um, 
I was doing some pre-production work in, you know, in the downtime because it was with the Steep Canyon Rangers that Steve was playing. So uh, we worked on that. Uh, but at one point while I was backstage, Earl's uh, road manager came over to me and said, oh, would you like to play the banjo? I went, you mean Earl's banjo? Uh, yeah. Went, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to do that. When he recorded all of his greatest music on. And so I went over to Earl's dressing room uh, with Steve and Earl hands me his banjo and I start playing on it. And it was like, okay, this is like the holy grail here. This is Man. unbelievable. I'm playing Earl Scruggs' banjo. And he's sitting right there. And um, and then I handed the banjo over to Steve. And Steve, st excuse me, Steve put it into double C tuning, which uh, for you banjo geeks out there, which, and I'm one of them for sure, uh, is it just <laughs> a, t a tuning that's usually used in old time music. Uh, and claw hammer music, claw hammer playing. And Steve does a lot of claw hammer and play, um, has written a lot of tunes in double C tuning. And he plays a tune on it. And then he hands it back to Earl. And I never heard Earl play in this tuning before in any recording anywhere. And so he starts, he just immediately starts playing Brown's Ferry Blue. He C. And I went, holy moly. And I Whoa. was like, Earl, can I record you doing that? But I didn't want to be like that geeky guy doing that. And he just played it once. I, I, I remember a lot of what he did. I can sort of fake it, what he played. And then here's Brown's Ferry Blues on these recordings. And he does it in the key of G, in a totally different tuning, totally different key. It's like, God, he was that deep. They could just do two completely different versions of the same tune. I don't think I do that. <laughs> yeah that is that is so cool i never so when you do that version of the song with billy strings you're you're in g the song's in g uh and you're playing like exactly what earl played in on those tapes yes oh. exactly yeah that is so cool and there's one there's one solo that i there's one solo i took in there that earl played where he just slides up and down like four or five times back to back, just one thing after another, going sliding up, sliding down. It, you know, it doesn't do it justice for me to say that, but um, you know, it's, it is streaming under you know under my name. You can the, at the, as I'm saying this, which is April of twenty. Anyway, it's uh, it's just amazing what he did. I've never heard him do anything like that, and I had to get that on the. <laughs> so tell me about like technically when you made the record. You must have had to map that stuff out fairly in advance. Like you couldn't have just been like as far as the song with Billy Strings, you couldn't have just sort of jammed it because you would have had to have planned out where the breaks were. The length of the break would have to be exact. Was all that stuff kind of more mapped out than you normally would want to make in a record in like in, in a recording session? No, I mean it was pretty much the way I would always do it. Bela Fleck again was was producing that particular session, the two songs we did with Billy Strings, but no matter who, you know, I produced the rest of it with some help from the engineer, uh, Lawson White. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I was, with that exception, with, that, with the exception of that tune, A Gentle in My Mind, which Balin helped put together. Yeah, you always want to go in, even though there it's called Earl Jam, and people are jamming what they play. I mean, it's Billy Strings, he's going to jam. And, uh, but yeah. the length of the, the length of, and the length of the form is, is the same, you know, it's not like, um, like it's not, although there are a couple of, a few places on the album where I do take two or three solos in a row, as Earl did, uh, which is unusual for a, a bluegrass album. Usually you take one solo and that's it. Yeah. So there's a, there's a taste of that. Uh, but you, you, we figured out the order of, of who's going to take a, a break where. So it's not just someone starts, oh, no, you go, and they stop. And, you know, it, it has to be figured out in advance. That all has to be mapped out. And I, I'm sitting there with a the music stand in front of me with the tablature for what I have to play. Like, all these other folks, they got it easy. They just play what they play <laughs> themselves. They play what they do. And I'm the, agonizingly trying to make sure I'm playing it note for note. Exactly what Earl played. That's incredibly challenging. I can't even imagine how you could have pulled that off. But I guess if you prepared enough and you like had all that stuff down, like I would imagine that you you were like ready to go. So you're not probably like laboring over the tablature, are you? At that point, uh, most. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time with each tune, making sure uh, that I could play it smoothly in 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 the. Uh, in the actual practice of recording it. But there were there are a few tunes. We do Casey Jones, another thing that, well, that's another story. Okay, well, Casey Jones, the train song, 
um, what he did is so subtle that, you know, for all, he just played it that way. That's just coming out of the naturally. For me, it was, I mean, I could play it. I understood how to do it. And I wrote, excuse me, wrote it out, but uh, to do it just on the fly, yeah, it's mostly everything he played exactly. I wanted everything to be exact. And that's another case in point, Casey Jones, somewhere in the 80s. I was in a band called Skyline in the 1980s, and we played the Birchmere in Alexandria, Virginia, just, you know, the south part of the Beltway around D.C. And uh, I guess we were sharing the bill with John, and uh, we were talking afterwards, and John said he'd been uh, just the day before or two days before been at this jam session with Earl Scruggs, and he said, oh, yeah, and Earl played Casey Jones. I went, whoa, really? Because uh, I never knew that Earl played Casey Jones. I was, I was into trains when I was a kid, and my mother used to sing that to me. So oh, what did Earl play on that? So I remember John playing for me, Casey Jones, in drop C tuning, which is where you take the fourth string, geeking out here, sorry, from D down, to, instead of being a standard G, just take the fourth string down a whole step to C, from D down to C. And John played it to me, you know, it wasn't exact, exact, but he gave me the idea of what he had done there. And I thought, wow, that's cool. And then again, here, on, on the, in these jam sessions that I'm using for recording purposes, he did it in totally different, he did it in standard G tuning. So another case of a tune where he did it in two different ways, completely different ways. So it, that's in, really insightful into the, his crazy musical brain and, and yeah. how he would be able to adapt to those different tunings and styles so easily. So do you play in open G the entire like standard banjo, <clears throat> sorry, standard banjo tuning for the whole record then? Or do you switch into C or drop C at some point too? Um, there's one tune I do that uh, where I'm in drop C because there's one note. He plays one note on the <laughs> bottom string where it's open. Literally one note. But I wanted to get that one note. And it's a tune you called Shout, L- yeah. Shout Lulu. Shout little, either I think it's shout little Lulu, and he's he's talk, he's you know sitting there with John, and he's saying here's the tune that I played. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Here's the tune I used to play when I was a kid. I play square dances just by myself, and I would play this tune. And for me, that's very exciting because the earliest recordings we have of Earl are with Bill Monroe in let's say 1946, 47. And the very first tune that Earl ever recorded with Bill Monroe was Heavy Traffic Ahead. And that's a whole other story. But anyway, that that's the very first tune. So 1946 is the first recorded evidence we have of Earl playing. He was playing with a guy named Lost John Miller just before that, but they never recorded. Um, so this, if, assuming that it's at least somewhat similar to what he was playing when he was a teenager, is the earliest example of anything Earl ever in drops. And it, it's a, yeah, and it's a fiddle tune uh, that uh, Ralph Stanley used to play, Clawhammer style, in his shows once in a while. He said it was a tune my mother taught me, but here's one that Earl uh, played at these square dances. So it's like kind of unearthing this very early aspect of what he played, apparently. So, yeah. And that may be the only tune in a different wow. tuning uh, that I do on here. I, I sort of regret, I, I, I okay. wish that. Um, I had at least taken a swing at doing Browns Ferry Blues and that double C tuning, uh, just modulated into a different key to do that uh, during the Billy String session. I kind of regret not doing that, but anyway, I, I <laughs> could do it on the I could do it on the next album. Yeah. Is double C is that the the high string would be the G, but then it would be C G C D. Is that correct? Correct. It'd be the fifth string, the short string is is G, and then the fourth low fourth string is C, and then G, and then instead of a B on the second string, it's tuned up a half step to C, and then D. Okay, everyone out there listening to you, get your banjos. Let's try this all together. <laughs> yeah, that's that's correct. The second and fourth strings are tuned to C. I can totally relate to that because I, I I play Weisenborn and I tune my Weisenborn to a very similar kind of tuning a lot of the time. So that tuning to me feels very... Uh, I do play a little bit of banjo, not a ton, but that tuning feels very at home to me for sure. Oh, okay. Well, so I don't know what a Weisenborn, uh, what is a Weisenborn? I'm not familiar with a Weisenborn. It's like the precursor to the dobro. It's like the Hawaiian oh. guitar that failed. Right. <laughs> it's got a it's got a hollow neck mm-hmm. and uh, it was meant for Hawaiian music, but it was too quiet really to be able to pull it off. And so that's where nationals were invented to fix that problem of Hawaiian guitar is not being loud enough to play in a Hawaiian band. <laughs> right, right. 
And then from there, Dobros came. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. I, I actually have a, a national banjo, but uh, that's another off topic story. Oh, cool. But really, what a cool sound. Yeah. We've talked a lot about this new record, which is very exciting. I was wondering if you could tell me a bit, a bit about um, the scene that you came up in. It's, it's so interesting because it's like, you know, pulling from a lot of the the same music that a lot of the people that were coming through the Nashville scene at that time, like in the late sixties, early seventies, but you were in New York and you sort of stayed in New York. I don't, I don't know if you've stayed there your whole career, but it, it seems to me like you have. Um, can you tell me a bit about the scene? Like you, you were from uh, Rochester, was it Rochester? S- Syracuse. Syracuse. Yeah. I, I just want to give you one Earl Scruggs quote, which relates, and then we'll get to the Syracuse, New York thing. Um, one of the greatest, Earl, the greatest Earl Scruggs quote, uh, and he wasn't the most talkative person in the world, but he was not shy, but sort of quiet. But this quote comes out, and I've confirmed it with the Earl Scruggs Center. He said, you can't encore the past. When I see a bright light shining out there, I want to move toward it. And so this idea wow. of not repeating himself, again, he did this thing in double C tuning, but then here he didn't do it, and just trying new things. And uh, And he said... Another quote from these um, from these sixty pages that we just got from the Mickey Mouse notebook was that one thing that he would get depressed in the studio, or it would depress him, the fact that okay, once this is recorded, it's that for all time; it can't change. It's because he always wanted things to change and move forward. Uh, or if he made a mistake, it was there for all time. Uh, but he liked the idea of just moving forward and progressing and tr- trying new things. So, which relates to that. So I just wanted to get that, put, put that on the record here, put this on the congressional record. I love it. So, uh, but anyway, but yeah, that's, a, that's a great quote. It is a great quote, <laughs> but putting it back to Syracuse and New York, you're wondering what the scene was like at the, back then. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated by that because it seems to me like you doing what you were doing could easily have ended up moving to Nashville or maybe California or somewhere where that scene was really strong as well. But you ended up in New York and you've stayed there. And and I'm just wondering, you know, what that, uh, what that whole thing was like back in those years. Well, I was very fortunate. I was playing in three, ba- three food bands in the early, uh, early seventies. I was in a group called country granola, which was a sports rock band. And that's another yeah. story. Uh, country cooking <laughs> with Pete Wernick uh, from hot rise and other folks and then breakfast special. And uh, we recorded uh, two, actually three country cooking albums while I was in the band. And on the second one, Andy Statman, incredible mandolin player and clarinet player and saxophone player at the time. And Kenny Kosick, wonderful fiddler. They came up from New York City. Pete Warnick brought them up from New York City to record on the second album, Barrel of Fun. And and there was sort of three that we were up in uh, upstate New York you know, coming from bluegrass, you know, you know, loving bluegrass music and being able to play a lot of that music, but also trying to stretch, stretch things and go in different directions. And when Andy and Kenny moved, uh, were taking the bus ride, you know, there was a certain ennui about living in Syracuse at that point. And I was glad to get out. So when they invited me to move to, to uh, New York City, I, I did. Dobro, a wonderful Dobro player who passed recently, unfortunately. And um, John, Jim Tolls from Atlanta, Georgia on guitar and vocals. And we put out only, we were together from 73 to 75 and put out an album uh, a year after we broke up. We would do Hawaiian music. We did Princess Papuli Has Plenty Papaya. Uh, we would do a Sam Cooke song. We would do, uh, you know, just Crazy. all sorts of different things. Yeah, bluegrass, rock, a tune called Sugar Bee, which is sort of, I think, a Clifton Chenier tune. Um, so we were all coming out of bluegrass, but doing these different things. And uh, so it was great being together with these like-minded individuals. And so uh, when I got to do my first album, Bluegrass Light in 74, I had these people who could sort of go with whatever I wanted to do, where I would have a saxophone solo in the middle of a bluegrass tune. Maybe I was thumbing my nose at the bluegrass establishment, which which is, uh, you know, I love bluegrass, but it was sort of, well, yeah, I can, do, I can do this. And then it went into a saxophone solo later on. So, and then there was other stuff that was a little more traditional, but I was, you know, trying different things. So just to, feeling my oats. Yeah, you were, pushing, you were pushing the boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> just a little bit. And, and, and bluegrass, bluegrass audiences are, 
kind of notorious for not wanting I'm making, the formula to be messed with. Yeah, so I'm making amends now in my later years by it's total Earl Scruggs. Okay, <laughs> is, is all is all forgiven, please? <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm penitent. <laughs> Was that something that you really had to struggle with in the early years when you were wanting to bring in? drums and electric bass and sax and all this cool stuff that you were doing, but was it kind of received with resistance from that established crowd? I would get news that would be less than complimentary, shall we say. Yeah. Yeah. In Blue, yeah. In Bluegrass Unlimited and County, County Sales was a, a mail order Bluegrass record outfit. Uh, it, it, was, they were, it was great, but they didn't really care for what I was putting out there. You mentioned one of the bands being a sports rock band. What is, I don't even know oh, what that is. Oh, you know sports rock. Oh, come on. Everybody knows what sports rock. Okay. No, it was this crazy band I was in based in New York. And we were together for a couple of years. And uh, the leader of our band, Herbo Firestein was his name. And he was from Buffalo and he was really into sports. And so he would, it was sort of a comedy, somewhat of a comedy band. We would do uh uh, well, this one I can't say. Um, I'm a lineman for the Giants, and I play the front line. You know, th things like that. And then we we had a baseball okay. medley, a football medley, a basketball medley, and a hockey medley. And we would do these things. Oh wow! Okay, so it was sports rock. It was sports rock. <laughs> I get it. Where was the commercial appeal here? I'm not sure, but we were yeah. together for a couple <laughs> years. So, so when you were playing banjo in these bands that were essentially kind of more rock instrumentation than bluegrass were you playing through amps and pickups and stuff or were you, were you just playing into a microphone just playing it still? playing into a microphone in those early years i, th I think i bet well the trouble was banjo pickups were horrible uh not to and I, won't, <laughs> I won't mention companies but there there's some really bad bad ones even as late as um i was in a band called uh farm report for about a year amongst doing other things this would have been I think 1990 or something like that, with a guy named Richie Stearns, a wonderful, wonderful clawhammer player and, and just great, great human being from uh, Ithaca, New York. And we put this band together with uh, Roger Mason, the bass player from Breakfast Special and uh, a percussionist from out in Pittsburgh. And um, it was sort of, I was into fusion music. So there was Weather Report. This was Farm Report to be a little, and we had two banjos in the band. <laughs> and I remember doing this one gig Perfect. In, Tru in Trumansburg, New York, Nap and I had a pick up one of these lousy pickups, and there was so much interference from the lights that I couldn't face the audience. I had to face the sideways to the audience to get the <laughs> buzz, the hum to go away. So things are better in more recent years, of course. But yeah, in the old days, I would just be playing uh, into a microphone. And influence wise, for you, like obviously Earl Scruggs, we don't need to mention him again because he was clearly like a huge influence on you, but. Uh, like Bill Keith was probably somebody that, because you've done so much stuff, to, you know, taking from the that sort of chromatic style that he came up with. Were there other people too that you would say were huge on your radar as a like as a youngster growing up, or was it more just like Earl and maybe Bill Keith? And what, were, yeah, were there other people for you? There were other banjo players, uh, Don Reno, who was sort of, in my perception, forgotten a lot today. A lot of people. You know, don't really know his music, but he, Don Reno at, at the time when I was, I started in 1963 and it was Earl Scruggs, Don Reno, Bill Keith has just come on the scene, but Don Reno was really big and he played in the so-called single string style, which is sort of taking a guitar approach to the banjo. Uh, and he apparently got it from a guy named Eddie Adcock, who was in the Country Gentleman for a bunch of years, the yeah. classic Country Gentleman band. And I once wrote a book about I wrote a book, uh, wrote an article about the three major banjo styles, Scrug style, uh, melodic style that Bill Keith championed, and then single string style that came from Don Reno. And then I got a sort of, not a nasty letter, but a correcting letter, shall we say, from Eddie Adcock saying that he, in fact, and I was friend, friendly with Eddie, but saying he was <laughs> the one that got Don Reno to playing full length solos in the single string style. And of course, these days, Bela Fleck uh, has taken it to the moon, just... Uh, Rather than playing out of a certain position, as Don Reno did, just playing up and down f fluidly uh, across the fingerboard, which is what Bela feels one of his many, many contributions, uh, you know, with his amazing work effort. And um, 
and uh, just his genius, uh, just expanding what the banjo could do to, to limitless possibilities. Yeah. But anyway, those those were the three. But there was Sonny Osborne, who the Osborne brothers, who was one of my big heroes, and Alan Shelton, who played with Jim and Jesse. So there, there were others, but those were the the main ones. And then Bobby Thompson is another one of my big banjo heroes to this day, who was if you ever saw Hee Haw, uh, the soundtrack, the uh, the main theme uh, is him playing all these crazy bluesy scales, and he was doing the melodic style before Bill Keith in the fifties. And then there was another guy named Carol Best, who was doing it in the forties, playing this note for note fiddle tuny kind of style that Bill Keith popularized, but others were doing it before him. Did you get a chance to hang out with Bill Keith? I, I did get a chance to hang out with Bill Keith. Again, he was my, my hero. Uh, I just loved his music so much. And when I was a teenager, when I was, this would have been 66, I was 17. I went with our guitar player, the band I was in at that point called the Down City Ramblers. And we took a bus trip down to New York City to see Bill Monroe at the Gaslight Cafe. And uh, I stayed at my grandmother's place because she had an apartment on Washington Square North. And before the show, we went into the Folklore Center where Bob Dylan was hanging out four or five years before that and grabbed some instruments off the wall. And we were just jamming in there. And my back was to the door and our guitar player looked up. He just walked in with Peter Rowan. I said, I don't remember if you remember me. I was so nervous. I said, I said that as opposed to, I don't know if you remember me. And he sat down with me for an hour and showed me all this stuff. He was so generous. Why would he hang out with this kid, you know, from Syracuse, New York? And he showed me all this stuff. Did some recording together. And I'm forgetting another one of my banjo heroes, Eric Weisberg, who's the guy that when all the, the the dueling banjos that everybody knows, that is Eric Weisberg playing that. But um, I was doing this banjo camp years ago in uh, in Massachusetts, and you would have a roommate. And so my roommate was Eric Weisberg. And, uh, and so we're in our pajamas just talking. And I'm thinking, this is pretty cool. You know, when I was a kid, if someone had said, someday you're going to be a peer of Eric Weisberg's, and you're going to be hanging out, you're going to be roommates. And then at that moment, there's a knock on the door. Bill Keith comes in, and the three of us are just chatting, you know, late at night after the proceedings are done at the workshop. And I thought, God, here are my two of my biggest banjo heroes ever, and, and now we, we can just hang as friends, you know. It was, it was a, really, a really nice thing. So Eric Weisberg was another one who yeah. was a very forward-thinking banjo player who influenced me. You've written books and done a lot of teaching over the years. And at some point, were you teaching Bela Fleck, like when he was a, a youngster? I, I don't, I don't know what that connection is, but I, I heard that you were teaching him for a little while or something. Yeah, uh, he was. I think he was pretty sure he was 16 years old. This would have been around 1973. Uh, Bela had two previous teachers. For, he had a guy named Eric Darling, who was the banjo player in the Weaver after Pete Seeger left, and I guess he took some lessons from him. And then he found a. Uh, who's a great New York banjo player uh, who could play all the styles, you know, Scruggs, melodic, single string. And um, uh, so he was taking lessons from Mark and was, you know, he was a great teacher and a great player. And, um, but Bela somehow had gotten a hold of my first album, my first crazy album, and wanted to learn some of those songs. So he'd, hey, hey Mark, can you show me the song that Tony wrote that's on this first album? And so Mark would laboriously figure out some crazy thing that I had written, show it to Bale. And after a couple of lessons like this, and I was living in the Bronx, I had moved to New York to play with the Bronx was special at this point and was living in the Bronx. And at this point, Mark said, look, just start taking lessons from Tony. I don't have the energy to figure these things out. And he did. So I get a call from this, this kid who would come up to the Bronx for lessons. And one of the things, I'd show him a couple of my tunes and then, he'd asked me to just sort of jam out on a traditional tune, like little Maggie or something like that. And I'd, I'd play it and he would record these things. He had a t little cassette machine and I would play, you know, five or six times through a tune going kind of, well, get pretty wild with it. And then he would go home and come back the next week, being able to play every bit of it note for note. Uh, he, you know, he wow. just had that drive at that point to just, he was already, he was already Bela Fleck at that point. <laughs> and so, you know, after a relatively short period of time, neither of us remember how long it was, a few a few months or whatever, uh, that we just started just jamming out together. And it was, you know, I, I, I think in, in retrospect, I would have done more of the traditional. I would have 
gotten him a little deeper into Scruggs style or something like that. But he got there anyway, needless to say. And you know, so, yeah, you don't you, you don't need yeah. lessons anymore. Let's just yeah, jam out. Right. That's this is at the age of sixteen. And it's interesting because there's a, a young guy named Nikolai Margulis right now who lives in Princeton, who's playing Bela things. He's 16 years old, and uh, he was at Bela's Blue Ridge banjo camp when he was 12 years old. Got up in front of 2,000 people and played confidently in front of them. And he's he's like oh. a, the next generation. So the banjo is in really good hands moving forward here, no doubt. In going through some of your early stuff, like as far as like digitally what's available, some of, a lot of the early records of yours aren't available, but there is this one on Apple Music called The Early Years. And I'm not clear which right. albums that is from, but it's, I love that record. It's so great. But what, what am I listening to? Is that a compilation of a couple of the early records? It's it's uh, the first and second albums. First album, Bluegrass Light, and I'm now remembering the name of my second album, which is Heartland. So those those are my first two albums, and it's just back to back. Those complete two albums. That's that, so the, that's all there. Okay. And the, my my third album, Banjo Land, um, had, of all my albums, that might have been in a way the most commercial because it had Tony Rice on it and David Grisman and Vassar Clements and uh, Buck White and Jerry Douglas. What the first half of it was all traditional blue. It was like Follow the Leader, this Don Reno tune, and Foggy Mountain Breakdown, Dixie Breakdown yeah. by Don Reno. And we're just jamming on these tunes. And Tony Rice sings one song on there, um, Don't Let Your Deal Go Down. The second half of the album is more weird stuff for me, my stuff. But that's the only album that Rounder never put out on um, my album. My label was Rounder Records. It's the only album that they never put out on CD. And the new album... Earl Jam album was coming out on Down the Road Records, which is a new label. This will be the first release. Uh, the original three rounders, the, the three folks that started Rounder Records and had it for many years, sold it to Concord. And then we're just off the, the, that scene for many years. And they decided, let's go back into the record business and started Down the Road, road Records. But anyway, these original wow. three rounders uh, never put out Banjo Land, my third album, but I was speaking to Ken Irwin. One of the uh, more recently was while well, we're you know I'm doing this album for them, this Earl Jam album for them, and said, well, "Can you get? Can we get Banjo Land out there on uh, you know streaming on Spotify and Apple Music?" And and it finally did. He he made it happen. So that's finally out there. So on the early years, which is the first two, who's in the band? Mostly, it's uh, a lot of it is Kenny Kosek uh, on fiddle. Andy Statman on mandolin, a um, guy named Russ Berenberg on guitar, who is in country cooking. John yep. is on some of the tunes. Roger Mason, the breakfast special bass player, he's on there. Um, th that's a lot of who's on there uh, on those first two albums. Okay. That's sort of the, the core. You seem to have coaxed some of the craziest playing out of some of these players that I have heard, like the way that they approach... You know, there's a tune like uh, Two If By Night that has like super out dobro and fiddle heads and stuff like that. And you don't hear people playing like that normally. Was that something that you were just like encouraging everybody to play super chromatically and like kind of outside the box? No, they didn't. They needed no coaxing. They could just do that. I mean, I think the <laughs> fact that, yeah, the fact that we were in a band together, again, D D Stacey Phillips was on dobro and he... He was just really, he could really play out. He was one of the great Dobro players of all time. And I talked to him, he passed. And Jerry said that Jerry did this album. I can't remember the name, but it was like a comp, it was just getting a bunch of Dobro players together all in one to, to record. And some of the other guys that were going to be on the album said, why do you have Stacey Phillips on there? Because he was so out. He could play really, could, I mean, he could do traditional Hawaiian music, which no one else, no, no other Dobro yeah. players I know ever went through that, knew how to do that. Uh, and he could play like Uncle Josh, who, you know, Flatten Scruggs is a Dobro player, but he had his own style, which is really, could be really out. And uh, so, some of these Dobro players were saying, why, why'd you have him on there? Because he's so out. And Jerry said, hey, he can play rings around you guys. He's, he's a great Dobro player. And to have Jerry say that was, was really wonderful. So, you know, these guys could play out, you know, if they were in a traditional setting, they'd play traditionally, but I have someone on your album. If you, if you can't, if you don't let them do what they want to do, Andy yeah. Statman, uh, record band player one time, and the banjo player said, "Oh, could you play like Doyle Lawson?" 
why would you get Andy Statman to play like Doyle Lawson? Get Doyle Lawson <laughs> or somebody who plays really traditionally. So, so you know, and, yeah. and Andy can really get out there in a wonderful, wonderful way. So. So I saw you like a year and a half ago uh, in New York at the, I guess it was the, is it the bottom line or the bitter, uh, bitter end? What, which club is that? Uh, it was you and Michael Daves and Andy Statman. I don't remember who else was in the band. Oh, it was the bitter end that. probably. It was, it was the three of you. It, it probably was the bitter end. Yeah. We, we would just once in a while, I think Kenny Kosek wanted to kind of put the band back together just, just for fun, just to play some local gigs, that kind of thing. And um, we have Michael Daves, the incredible, incredible guitar player and singer. Uh, yeah. He took the place of Jim Tolls because Jim Tolls is living in Maine now. And interestingly, Michael Daves is from Atlanta and took lessons from Jim Tolls. So there's this lineage there. So, yeah, so we haven't done oh, it now cool. in you know, a year or so. But, yeah, we, we would play here and there. We would do a few gigs at the bitter end. Currently, then, if you do shows, how like do you have a preferred format for how you play? play band wise do you have an, is there like a tony trishka band currently well there's an earl jam band uh i put together okay and there it's uh, the core band is well basically the idea is to the first half of the show is uh, an overview of earl's career uh starting with reuben which is the first tune he played in the three finger style when he was a kid and then getting and then we go to um Heavy Traffic Ahead, as I mentioned before. And then, you know, we do Foggy Mountain Breakdown. We do Salty Dog. We do the Beverly Hillbillies theme, you know, the Ballad of Judd Clampett and things like that. And have a little sing-along with the audience, sing-along on that. Got to have a sing-along. I'm a folky from way back, so. Yeah. I'm a big fan of, of Pete Seeger, so you got to have a sing-along. And uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, then the latter part of the show is tunes from the jam sessions that will be on the album. And okay. so the core band, because it's not it's not like, um, you know, we go out on the road 52 weeks a year and doing that. This is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm playing very consistently right now with this band because I've got a great agent, Lee Olson, out of Nashville. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. promoting the album. Uh, I'm not, people are on retainer, it's not that sort of thing. But the core band is, um, I've got Michael Daves on guitar and a guy named Jared Engel on uh, bass, an incredible bass player from, from Brooklyn. And uh, when I can, I use uh, Alex Hargraves on uh, fiddle oh, because cool. he lived in Brooklyn. He's one of the great fiddlers, period. He's one of the greatest fiddlers there is, except some guy named Billy Strings stole him away from us. So, you know, since Billy Strings <laughs> is on the road so much, hey, Alex, are you free? Well, yeah, not for the next six months, but after that. But anyway, <laughs> right around the record, really, say I'm going to use him on a few dates. And uh, a guy from Nashville named Nate Lee, a wonderful, wonderful fellow who's living in Rhode Island. Fortunately, someone moved up from Nashville instead of losing everyone. Wow. Brittany Haas, one of my all-time favorite fiddlers, who just, as I say, I always talk about her bionic bowing arm because she's just got the greatest, deepest groove in the world. Uh, she lives in Nashville, but uh, she does some gigs from time to time. We're doing the Gray Fox Festival this year, and she's going to be there, so she's going to be our fiddler for that. Oh, great. And how extensively are you going to be touring the this Earl project? A lot, a lot. I'm, I'm doing it a lot right now. I just was in Savannah, Georgia this past weekend and uh, going to be in Maryland and D.C. in that area next weekend, as, as we're saying this in April of 74. Oh, 74, good, 24. Um, going to be out in California, Colorado, just lots of lots of touring. Uh, to promote the album and just because I love doing it. I love Earl Scruggs and I love being able to play these tunes. So, and I do a few of my own tunes just to kind of pepper it in there with some of what I do, mm -hmm. including a tune called Kentucky Bullfight, which I uh, wrote in like 1970 or something like that, which sort of has a modern feel to it. <clears throat> and then I recorded with Country Cooking <clears throat> on the second Country Cooking album. Do you feel handcuffed at all by that? Like when you are when you set out to do a show that's like these Earl oriented shows that you basically have to you kind of have to like do the the thing exactly. Does that hinder you as an artist, or are you just like down with doing that for right now? I'm, I'm down with doing it. I, I wouldn't want to do it for the rest of my life because you know I have other things I'm I'm wanting to do. I'm working on a side project very slowly, uh, putting music to Emily Dickinson poems. And at some point I'll do that. But uh, at the moment, oh, this cool. is, and I'm loving it. And, and it's, and the audience loves it. You know, they love to, Hey, do you want to hear Salty Dog? Yeah. You know, and they, they love singing along with the Jed Clampett tune. So, um, 
so it's really fun that I get to tell part of Earl's story and some of these stories, you know, from these these writings from the Mickey Mouse Notebook. Uh, so it's it's really satisfying, and I love playing Earl. So and doing the jam session tunes, yeah. and and so and and I I try to get fairly close to the the way he played these tunes. Some I I can do exactly, but some I I just approximate, and I can turn them, I can switch them around too because it's fairly straight ahead. So rather than just doing the exact same tunes every time, I can hey, let's put one of these in there. There's a really cool thing that's going to be on the new album called Freight Train Blues, which is on Bob Dylan's first album, but for the recording, I went back to a, a Roy A cup version from 1936, which might be the earliest version. And it starts oh, yeah. like with it, the whole band goes down, 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 like a train down. building up speed. <laughs> and I got, I got Dudley <laughs> Cannell from the seldom seen and uh, to sing on that one and play guitar. And in fact, I just, I just toured with him in North Carolina uh, and some other dates about two weeks ago. So Dudley Cannell, who's this incredible singer, one of the best there is um, to do some touring. But anyway, that's going to be on one of these albums. And so I got to do that with him. And with some of these variations in personnel, we, we do some slightly different tunes. So it, it stays interesting to me. Well, Tony, thanks so much for um, telling me about this project and talking about the banjo and <laughs> stuff. It's great to talk to you and and this project is so fascinating to me like I, I i just can't believe that you got your hands on that and uh i think you're the right person to to do it and and so thanks for doing it and i i can't wait to hear the rest of the record and hope everyone listens to it and i uh, hope to see you out touring it oh i so appreciate that thanks for giving me the opportunity to do worth about this and um just really ex- <clears throat> excuse me so losing my voice here a little bit um <clears throat> I was just fortunate to get all the people on the album that I was able to, like Billy Strings and Molly Tuttle and Sierra Farrell is on three tunes on there. And uh, Del McCurry oh, cool. is on there. And uh, yeah, Sierra Farrell has a new album out speaking, which is, which is incredible. Yeah, and Sam Bush is on there and Michael Cleveland and the whole cast and crew, Stuart Duncan, just all the side folks that are on there are just incredible. So I've been very, Man. very fortunate to get them all on there and, and thanks for letting me talk about it and just geek out on banjo. My pleasure. So I hope to see you down the line somewhere on the road. Hope so. Okay, yeah. thank you, Tony. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Music Makers and Soul Shakers is a bi-weekly podcast produced at the Hen House Studio in Nashville, Tennessee. Please remember to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. You can also find us at makersandshakerspodcast.com. Thanks again to our sponsors this season, Larivay Guitars, Fishman Pickups, Chase Bliss Pedals, Union Tube and Transistor, Spectra 1964, and The Hen House Hang. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Music